a quote from John Milton, and Milton's Aeropagitica is making a statement against the English Parliament for setting up a licensing board to pre-approve publications. So this is, uh, this is a sally into a discussion of prior restraint. And Milton is making a statement against government censorship through prior restraint. And he says, he writes, books are not absolutely dead things, but do contain a potency of life in them to be as active as that soul was whose progeny they are. Nay, they do preserve in a vial all the purest efficacies and extraction of that living thing that bred them. I know they are as lively and as vigorously productive as those fabulous dragon's teeth, and being sewn up and down may chance to spring up armed men. Now, Milton is worried about those dragon's teeth, the books that may cause armed men to spring up if they are sewn. And so I see my work, my recent work, as being about these dragon's teeth. So uh, I write, I'm writing about what I call popular weapons manuals. Um, it was actually a bit difficult for me to decide what to call these. Um, they happen, in law enforcement, they're often just blanket uh, called anarchist cookbooks. Um, but I think this is the most descriptive, even though sometimes I, I've, eventually, I've sometimes strayed off from this term because um, I've talked about a book called Secrets of Meth Methamphetamine Manufacture, which fits into a kind of fuzzy set. Um, but mostly what I focus on are manuals uh, that teach people how to make bombs and other kinds of weapons. Uh, and I can really classify them into three types. Uh, the first are army manuals. And uh, these are written for, uh, for soldiers in the field, um, often to agitate and to teach, uh, to, to teach uh, uh, civilians where they are, how to make bombs and explosives to, to join the resistance. Um, and so I have here the Special Forces Handbook, which, was a, a, which is a very popular one. Now these army manuals are in the public domain. And this is an important aspect of these. Um, in 1970, the Army did try to classify a few of these after they were already were in the public domain. They were already floating all over the place. Um, one of them was called booby traps, which really uh, teaches people how to create quite, quite dangerous uh, explosive weapons. Um, and the Army sent libraries pre-stamped envelopes to send back, back booby traps so that they could but you can imagine the absurdity of that, uh, trying to get the libraries to send back these special forces handbooks, which they might, might have collected. Now, because these, these kinds of handbooks are in the public domain so that they could be ordered, they also came out with soldiers, um, uh, they could be reprinted by small publishing houses. Um, one of them, the most famous is Paladin Press. There was also a, a publishing house called Lumpanics, but there are also a bunch of number of smaller outfits that began in the 1960s to, to reprint uh, these kinds of, of handbooks. So the second one is that you can see how these publishers try to make them look official, like they really came from the army. But if you know the, if you know the visual aesthetic of army manuals, you can immediately recognize that this is a, a different kind of publication. Uh, and so these tend to just, uh, just uh, c contain the technical information without political statements. Um, however, there are often kind of political motivations for writing and publishing, publishing these and collating them. Um, and then finally, uh, in the third category are these weapons manuals that actually have some kind of political message in them. Uh, one is the Anarchist Cookbook. Um, most of my students have heard of it. I don't know if you have. I'm going to pass it around. Uh, the Bianicus Cookbook, which I'm going to talk about a little, a little bit more later, uh, was published in, in 1971. Um, and it's a compendium of, of bomb making explosives, eavesdropping equipment, how to make drugs, uh, etc. So I'll pass that one around. And by the way, um, these are quite distinct from classified technical information. That's an important distinction for me, that, that I'm talking about stuff that's in, that's in public, that's not classified. Um, uh, however, uh, I will talk just briefly about a case in which, uh, of nuclear se secrets, in which there was a controversy over classification. Okay. So now I'm going to go way back 
to the Haymarket trial, which most of you are familiar with, I'm sure, being historians. Um, the Haymarket trial in 1886 is really the first evidentiary use of a popular weapons manual. So for those of you who may not be familiar, um, uh, during the Haymarket trial, eight, eight anarchists were convicted of conspiracy for throwing a bomb in a rally and killing eight police officers. Uh, four of them were hung, and it was a, quite a sensational trial. Now, Science of Revolutionary Warfare by Johann Most is a weapons manual that was introduced at the trial. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass around uh, an edition of this as well, but this is not the original. Um, this one, one was published in 1970 by Desert Publications. Desert Publications was implicated in the trial of Timothy McVeigh for publishing another manual called Homemade C4. This is the first time that an English translation of Science of Revolutionary Warfare was actually published. It came out in German um, in, in 1883. So let me just say something about Science of Revolutionary Warfare. Um, it was a spin-off from a, a publication called the Anarchist Socialist Review, which was published by Nathan Gans in Boston. Now, Nathan Gans managed to get one issue of this review out. Uh, it talked about tactics, but he was planning to do another one in which he laid out bomb-making techniques for, uh, for an anarchist revolution. And he imagined all kinds of things, like uh, putting arsenic in pipes in the cities, and he was, he was quite a prolific and inventive, imaginative terrorist. <laughs> Um, now, before he could actually get to the second, uh, to the second issue, he was, rest he was arrested for, uh, for, for a, a phony um, scam, a, a scam to sell phony watches. So the Boston police managed to arrest him and put him in jail before he could put out the second issue. Now, he was a friend of Johann Most, so Johann Most went ahead and started publishing uh, bomb-making information in his own publication, Freiheit, uh, and then he published it in this volume, Science of Revolutionary Warfare, the Krieg Wissenschaft. Um, now, uh, he compiled this with other experimenters. This isn't a single authored volume. He talks about his other, the other people that he's writing with. Um, and what he wants to do is he wants to take scientific and technical instructions for explosives and weapons manufacture and make them available to ordinary people. So he really speaks against science and technical in, uh, language. And he wants to put this into ordinary language so that ordinary people can, can uh, understand it. Now, it occasionally makes, it's mostly focused on how to make dynamite and curare and tomate and all this <laughs> stuff, this pro proliferation of weapons. Um, but it occasionally makes threats. Not very often. It's not a, not a key part of the book, but he makes threats against the police and the wealthy. Um, so this, this text, is uh, Science of Revolutionary Warfare, is, is extensively read at the trial. And it's a key piece of evidence, even though there's absolutely no proof at all that Science of Revolutionary Warfare has anything to do with the bomb that was thrown at the Haymarket Rally. Uh, it's just used to damn the defendants. Uh, to, to to paint them as these dangerous folks. And so three things emerge, important things start to emerge then in this, in this trial. Um, these three domains of criminalization and contest over the social tolerance of these works. So first of all, there are constitutional arguments about um, freedom of speech that start to emerge, even though freedom of, the, the kind of free speech doctrine we know today is that does not exist at this time. But you start to hear arguments about freedom of the press and freedom of, the sp of speech connected to these manuals because defendants Albert Parsons and August Spies argued that they had as much right to publish technical information as could be found in military manuals and the mainstream news media which published bomb making information. Um, in the mainstream news media, the publication of information about bombs was accompanied by bomb descriptions, it, it accompanied these bomb descriptions with threats against labor, okay? So Spies and Parsons said, yeah, well, why can't we do it? If you, if you do it, why can't we? Um, so so there, there were those kinds of arguments starting to emerge, and they really, since Haymarket was such a sensational trial, they really influence uh, discussions that lead up, for example, to the formation of the ACLU. 
Um, uh, there's also uh, an issue with the rules of evidence. Can you use these kinds of manuals in court? Is, is, it, is it within a defendant's right not to have these uh, kinds of manuals used in court? Now the judge at the trial, Judge Joseph Gary, ruled that even though science of revolutionary warfare couldn't be directly implicated in the bomb making, um, it was enough to prove criminal conspiracy. And he said, even just having it, what he said, in view, in view, meant that these people were guilty of conspiracy. Okay, so just, if they had it in the next room, that was enough to show some kind of conspiratorial intention. Uh, eventually, the anarchists were pardoned, but you can see, but these kinds of issues now are, are, are uh, really uh, coming to the fore. There's also the police collection of evidence on the ground. Even before the Haymarket trial, the Chicago police were looking for science of revolutionary warfare. And there's at least one case where they arrest somebody when they find science of revolutionary warfare in a trunk in his house, in his apartment. So, so there's an issue about the police going out and looking for this kind of evidence, these kind of books, which they believe show that, that, uh, that the defendants are enemies of the state. They're looking for enemies of the state. Okay, so we have, with Haymarket, we have the establishment of a troubled genre. Um, of this kind of manual. And there are some key, it's a fuzzy set. And some of the problems with the genre are, it's not clear uh, how much you can define these works as political and how much is purely technical. Now this becomes actually quite important in discussions about these works because uh, if we think about free speech exemptions, there's an argument that all political speech is protected whereas technical information may not be. So the fuzziness between, are these political, are these technical, uh, there's political language in them, does that make them political works, becomes important. There's also illegitimate and legitimate domains. These works are often collated from official works, official chemical textbooks and so forth, as you'll see. I mean, those are legitimate domains for passing around explosive instructions, how to make bombs, but then these manuals start to fall into a category of illegitimate, even though there are no real laws against them. Um, and then we start to have a discourse about the right hands versus the wrong hands. There are the right hands for this dangerous instructional information, and then there are the wrong hands, that is, for example, enemies of the state or radicals who will use that information against the state. Now, um, these weapons manuals have certain conventions that become important that sort of identify them as a genre. So they, they're a compendia of a violent, um, usually violent techne, um, as you'll see as I pass them around, um, but they're often uh, just plagiarized. Uh, the Really, you, you can't really call it an author. The compiler uh, will just uh, go to the library or get books from other sources or get text from other sources right? and, and compile this all together in a new form uh, in, in this kind of work. So they're often taken from le legitimate works and compiled and, and collated. Uh, they're often multiply authored. It's very, very difficult to establish a single author. Part of it is because it's usually a group of people who are writing them, but also because it's collated. So it's coming from all these different sources, sometimes from other weapons, popular weapons manuals, sometimes from these official sources. Okay, so, and then their aim is to put technical information into an everyday language, vernacular. And uh, so they use simple processes and easy to obtain tools and materials. So uh, making dynamite in the kitchen, for example, science, science of revolutionary warfare tries to explain how to make dynamite in the kitchen. Uh, but Moss warns, yeah, but it smells really bad, so, so you probably don't really want to do it. <laughs> so, but there's, so just taking ladles and buckets and uh, sinks and, and the household materials and stuff that you can buy from the local drugstore, that you can make explosive that, out of that stuff becomes, uh, becomes, is usually in these kinds of works. So in the 19th century, um, the wrong hands is really identified as, I'm going to use a broad word, Fedians, although it's 
if I were doing a more detailed talk, I would talk about individual groups of beings, that these were Irish Americans who were in the United States uh, planning various attacks uh, on, on England. Um, and this is, a, this is a diagram that actually appeared in, some diagrams that actually appeared in a newspaper that were uh, developed by Professor Gaspard and Metzeroff, that's an assumed name. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he gave a reporter these, these sketchings for various kinds of weapons. So, so this one for right here is, is the head of a cane. And on the top is an exploding cigar. Now, I've seen the exploding cigar in weapons manual after weapons manual since this period. <laughs> it's just like a favorite thing that, that people, because you, know, you can think of the person who smokes a cigar, the wealthy, you know, capitalist. <laughs> So, so the, idea, the, the idea of the exploding cigars has haunted these manuals up to the present day. Here's a bottle bomb. Here's an Orsini bomb. So, uh, so uh, the right hands, though, is that this, is inter this becomes quite interesting because in the 19th century, those who try to establish themselves as the, as the right hands and say, well, we, we can circulate explosives information, we are the right hands to handle this kind of dangerous information, uh, they are the chemists. And um, uh, the chemists, uh, I have a newspaper art article up here, this is Colonel Vivian Magen. He set up, he was an investigator, a detective, and he's the progenitor of the forensic laboratory in the bomb squad. Uh, and he would go around, he was he was a publicity hog. And so he was uh, responsible for setting up the Explosives Act in the United Kingdom. But uh, he also loved to talk to the press. And he would talk to them in these very sensational terms. In fact, Scotland Yard was worried that he was giving away all kinds of secrets all the time because he, was just, he would tell, <laughs> tell the journalists everything. But he was often presented with, with bomb making photographs. Uh, sometimes he was pictured, he would be pictured in front of shelves full of bombs. And so um, uh, there are a couple of things happening. One, that the, the chemist, the scientist, the investigator, the scientific investigator begins to be established as the right hands who's a, who's, who can talk about these things without endangering the public, uh, as opposed to radicals who are who are endangering the public by doing essentially the same thing. Now, Majendi was uh, a friend of uh, an, an, a chemist in the United States called Thomas Chatter. He was the leading member of the Chemical Society and a researcher for the uh, Naval Torpedo Station. And in the late 19th century, he started making all of these uh, statements about, he wanted an explosives act, but he was really he really wanted to go to again. He wanted to go for radicals quite fiercely. He suggested that there be a law that would criminalize the use of explosives, and he said he would criminalize any threats, verbal or written, to use explosives, any incitements, verbal or written, of others to make such use against anybody in particular or society in general or an express approval of such actions. So, and he, what he thought is that if people were even talking about making explosives and weren't within legitimate spheres, that they should be arrested. Not only should they be arrested, but they should be given hard labor. Okay, just, for, just for talking about how to make explosives, that they were not within the right domain. Uh, so uh, I want to fast forward a little bit to 1914 and an, uh, a manual called La Salute in Boys. And this, uh, this was created by the followers of Luigi Gallianisti, who was calling for acts of violent revenge uh, against capitalists uh, for violent assaults on labor. And this <coughs> manual um, says that instead of being paralyzed by sorrow over these events, that instead let's, let's, take, let's take action. Let, let's arm ourselves, let's, let's go. Let's, let's take acts of revenge. Um, you can see, it's an Italian as you can see, but you can see that's explosive materials. It talks about how to make nitroglycerin, dynamite, uh, uh, cotton fulminate, uh, mercury, mercury fulminate, and other kinds of explosives. Uh, it was written, it's believed, 
by an Italian anarchist chemist who was also a professor at the Polytechnic Institute in Milan. Um, and it got transported over to the United States. And you can see a real sophistication. Um, there's a lots of references to different, different uh, laboratory procedures that you don't find in the earlier manual. Um, and uh, so you can really identify an increasing sophistication. Now, interestingly, uh, the title of this, uh, La Salute en Boy, uh, labor historians have often translated this as health is in you. However, Tolstoy's treatise on nonviolence was called the same, it had the same title in Italian. Uh, and so it's interesting, it seems, it's, it's quite possible that this version of the Explosives Manual is a, is a statement to Tolstoy uh, and his nonviolent principles, and saying, no, we're not going to be, be nonviolent. This is our alternative. OK, so, um, so La Salute becomes implicated in this case, the Abarno Carboni case in 1950. And so now we begin to see how this kind of text is used to manipulate and identify radicals as enemies of the state. Uh, so this was, these two men were arrested. You can see that the newspaper is identifying them incorrectly. Uh, they were arrested um, in a sting operation by the new New York City bomb squad. The New York City bomb squad is brand new. It had a stake and having some big splashy case, <laughs> and so it, it uh, formed the sting operation. So these men were suspected of being part of a group called the Bresci Circle, and uh, the, the bomb squad sent in a police spy, Amadeo Polignani, uh, to try to get some violent threats. And if, uh, it, I'm sure it will not surprise many of you that he was something of a provocateur. Uh, because that was quite typical at this time, the Senate provocateurs to try, try to get people into acts of violence. So, uh, disguised as Frank Baldo, Polignani bef befriended Frank Abarno, a 25-year-old electrotyper, and Carmine Carbone, an 18-year-old shoemaker. Uh, po Polignani approached them after a meeting, advocated dynamite as a political weapon, and convinced them that they should set off a bomb in St. Patrick's Cathedral. Now, by Polignani's account, it was Carbone who had drawn him out of the meeting and suggested that they blow up the church. Later, Abarno, Abarno gave Polignani a booklet that Carbone had bought for 15 cents at the Bresci Circle, La Salute and Voy. So Polignani turned it over to the bomb squad for copying. With some of the ingredients purchased by Polignani himself, and in a room Polignani had hired, they constructed a bomb. Uh, now, the bomb actually was not based on the last Lute and Boy. It was a very crude weapon that, was, that anybody who knew anything about fireworks could have made. So, uh, so on the morning of the plot, Polignani went and picked up a Barno to go and bomb St. Patrick's Cathedral, and they had their bomb. And uh, Carboni said he didn't want to go because he wanted to sleep. So he probably wasn't that interested in the plot. Now, as they proceeded to the cathedral, there were uh, Thomas Tunney, who was the head of the bomb squad, and a bunch of other uh, police detectives were following them. And there were also police detectives disguised as washerwomen. I guess my photo is going off, but <laughs> you can at least see their skirts there. Uh, so there were. There, there were police detectives in the church disguised as washerwomen. So as soon as they got to the church, uh, Polignani set the bomb. Uh, Abarno was supposed to light it, but he didn't. Uh, and then the detectives rushed upon them and arrested them. Now, uh, newspapers across the country carried the story that the arrests of uh, Abarno and Carboni were evidence of a power powerful conspiracy. And they carried photos of uh, the chief inspector, Owen Egan, and he's at the top of the right, and he's holding pieces of bombs. But he also had uh, his hands blown off um, from parts of his hands blown off from diffusing bombs. So he was he was kind of a, a depiction of how dangerous this work was. And so uh, Polignani was was fated as a hero. 
who had, in, who had infiltrated this group and found the secret bomb making manual. But it was interesting that at the trial, there was actually a free speech defense by Abarno and uh, Carboni's lawyer who said that uh, you could, they, they couldn't prove that the manual was connected to the device and there wasn't any law against these men owning this kind of manual anyway. So we start this, once again we start to get uh, these kinds of, of arguments about these manuals. The right hands start to become the detectives then who are investigating. They start publishing works that feature bomb making, descriptions of bomb making, uh, and this one, uh, Thomas Tony actually wrote a book about his escapades called Throttle, and this is actually a page that he has in the book that's from La Salute and Boy. So you can see how here, <laughs> if, it's, if it's under the guise of policing, this information is allowed to be transferred to audiences, but if it's, to, if it's produced by the Brescia Circle, if it's sold by the Brescia Circle, no. Okay. Now, uh, last one thing I'm going to say, keeps having a life. Uh, because when suspected uh, Gallianists, uh, Nico Sacco and Bartol Bartolomeo Vanzetti, were denied their appeal, and realized that they were on their way to the electric chair for murdering two men in an armed robbery, they issued a final missive to their supporters ending with the call, La Salute in the book. Now, anybody who was in that circle is gonna know. Lots of people in labor are gonna know what that meant. They're gonna know it was a threat. And they would have understood this as an implied threat. Um, but there was no evidence, I mean, Sacco and Vanzetti weren't accused of a bombing, they were accused of a murder, uh, with guns, uh, but this starts to get all wrapped up together. Now, J. Edgar Hoover becomes very, very interested in La Salute and Voy. And uh, he's, he's investigating some package bombs in 1919 that were sent to a bunch of judges, and also, also the Wall Street bombing of 1921, where uh, a galleonist, Mario Budo, probably, uh, put a, a a crude car bomb uh, on Wall Street, and it blew up and killed dozens of people. And uh, so Edgar, J. Edgar Herbert becomes very, very interested in La Salute des Bois, but he can't find it. He can't find it, but he sees that the files are all messed up. And so you can see, you know, when, when he becomes head of the FBI, then there becomes a, a great interest in file, in filing, collecting evidence, and having organized files. And then you start to see these bomb making, uh, these, uh, these kinds of instructions of bomb making manuals entering the FBI files. Uh, another, thing that, uh, another thing that happens then with the, with the Wall Street bombing in 1921 is so, that uh, for the first time, the press, the news media frequently carries images of bombs. They're seen as a kind of right hands. Uh, but in 1923, there's the first sense in the media that maybe they should be running these pictures, these photographs, these images, these diagrams of bombs. Uh, so there's an article by Roy Giles, and he wants to explain in Scientific American how these bombs are built, but he worries that, and this is a mock-up of the bomb, he worries that maybe they're giving too much information to audiences. So even though he has a mock-up of the bomb, it's not complete. It's not complete. There are no wires, for example, to the clock. Okay, so, so it's not enough information to really have somebody um, have somebody make one of these. Uh, and just to, uh, to touch on, on this a bit, um, <coughs> even the sabotage manuals of the IWW, which are they're not really they're not instructional manuals at all. La Salute was an instructional manual, but the sabotage manuals are not. The sabotage manuals that produ were produced by the IWW were discussions about direct action, quite detailed and interesting discuss discussions about whether <coughs> labor activists should, should use sabotage or whether they shouldn't, or whether capitalists were more saboteurs than laborers, and there's very interesting discussions in these books. But just because they're called sabotage, they really get to the attention of investigators, of detectives. 
Um, so, uh, for example, um, just before Christmas in 1917, energized by their purpose of defending the wartime nation against dangerous subversives, agents from the Department of Justice pulled up to the headquarters of the IWW in Chicago and ransacked it for evidence, carrying away truckloads of print material and even the typewriters. Uh, in, the war in a wartime nation in no mood for tolerance of criticism and dissent, the IWW's free speech ad agitprop in town centers, its questioning of the reasons for the war and its calls for disruptions of wartime manufacturing had brought down the heavy hand of the law. And now in these trials of the IWW, uh, of the IWW activists, the radicals, they start reading these sabotage manuals at the trial. Uh, the most, what they consider to be the most salacious ones, and they, they talk about any evidence that these uh, manuals are, are calling for sabotage. So in the end, um, this actually works to get uh, some 116 IWW labor radicals uh, convicted and, and imprisoned, some for 20 years. So you can see how the sabotage manuals are starting to have a quite an effect. Now, in Whitney v. California, um, Anita Whitney was a member of the Oakland Communist Labor Party, uh, and she made it to her, her case made it to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, she was a vocal advocate of, of progressive causes from women's suffrage to the minimum wage law, and pledged to communism as a way of ending uh, of ending poverty. So Whitney was arrested outside of a hotel after giving a talk to a women's club on slavery, racism, and economic injustice. And she was charged with five counts under Crim California's Criminal Syndic Syndicalism Act. Prosecution aimed to associate Whitney with the IWW through dubious witnesses, confiscated literature, and a nebulous chain of associations. And so even though she wasn't convicted in any way of sabotage or in relationship to sabotage, the prosecutors read these sabotage manuals as part of the trial. Now, this eventually gets to the Supreme Court. Uh, unfortunately, Whitney didn't, she wasn't basing her claim in court on uh, constitutional, on free speech um, uh, reasons. But Justice Louis Brandeis took up the free speech argument, even though Whitney hadn't brought it to the court. And even though Whitney's, the, the syndicalism charges were upheld against Whitney, uh, Brandeis um, made a statement in his dissenting opinion that said he, he references, he obliquely references the sabotage manuals. And he says that, that this kind of speech needs to be protected unless it is, it is going to threaten the very existence of the state, which is a pretty strict rule here. Okay, because the sabotage manuals are not threatening the existence of the state. Salute to lawyer then it's not uh, threatening the existence of the state. So Brandeis, uh, and this becomes an important point of discussion. Uh, Panther um, Paladin Press, as one of the publishers that starts taking up army manuals and reproducing them, uh, they originally, Paladin Press was originally called Panther Press, which comes to have a bearing for federal investigators because they think it's, it's created by the Black Panthers. <laughs> Even though the person who really created it was Robert K. Brown, who's kind of a virulent anti-communist <laughs> voice. And uh, Robert K. Brown set up Panther Press at first to publish his master's thesis uh, it's kind of a self-publishing operation because his master's thesis was on Alberta Bio. And uh, so the first, th so he starts uh, publishing, he published this 150 questions for a gorilla uh, by Bio, who is, who trained uh, Castro's freedom fighters. Uh, and so this, this book contains lots of diagrams. In fact, there's quite a, quite a beautiful one of a Molotov cocktail, which I think may have may have really influenced the, the iconography of the Molotov cocktail that you see throughout the 60s. But he's the one that's publishing it, and he's publishing it because he's trying to expose guerrilla warriors. He's, he's actually speaking against them. But uh, leftist groups 
get interested in, the, in, in this book and other books that are, be, that are produced by Panther Press, um, and they start collecting them. So in 1970, John McClellan uh, headed this uh, subcommittee on investigations. A lot of the people who were on that committee were former uh, QAC folks. Uh, and they hold two days of hearings on bomb making manuals, trying to figure out what to do with them. And I actually like this image right a lot because it's got a tiny bomb in the front here. Uh, how, to make a, how to make a bomb there uh, with the classic time device. Um, and they hold two days of hearings on, on bomb-making manuals and the terrible problems with them. And they, uh, they bring in 150 questions for a gorilla. And, uh, they uh, have lots of charts of where, how these bomb-making manuals are getting from one place to the other. They call Robert K. Brown surprised that he's not a Black Panther when he shows up. Uh, they, and they talk to him and he says, oh, well, you know, I, I'm not responsible for what happens after the books come out, you know. Uh, and, and, uh, they also call this guy, Kurt Saxon, this is the poor, man, poor man's James Bond, which I'll pass around. Uh, this was, he was a neo-Nazi that published uh, some manuals. And he just laughed at the committee and said, yeah, we, we need to publish more of these so that, so that uh, the citizens can, can attack the radicals at Kent State or something like that. And so, so they, they bring these people forward and they, and they decide though that they can't really do anything about these manuals at all because of Brandenburg v. Ohio. Um, Brandenburg, in Brandenburg v. Ohio, the classic uh, test of imminence uh, is, up, is, is produced, is upheld, which is that uh, you can't, if you just uh, say, oh, I'm gonna overthrow the state, that's not enough to get you arrested, but if you say to a crowd, okay, if you go over and burn down, Ronan knows my, my yeah. example now. <laughs> if you go, okay, go over and burn down the union at two o'clock tomorrow, that's the test of imminence. So uh, that's, that's the kind of speech that then, then is exempt from First Amendment protections. Uh, so they say, oh, well, we can't really do anything about bombing emails because we can't prove that there's imminence. Okay. Now, during the investigation, the committee persuaded the Treasury Department to send out agents to libraries to ask for books on guerrilla war so that they could find out whether libraries had this kind of information in the libraries. Uh, and uh, the librarians were absolutely outraged that Treasury Department agents were coming up and asking for, for the records of people who had taken out things like guerrilla warfare. Um, and so they they were quite incensed, but you can see also that, that this made the press a lot since the Treasury agents are quietly checking U.S. libraries for subversive readers, and you can see see the librarian looking a bit shocked. Um, actually, uh, Art Buchwald had a column about this, and he said, yeah, Trotsky learned it, everything he knew, knew from uh, Odessa Library Number 18, <laughs> making fun of this whole, whole uh, project. Now, this actually gives the context for the Anarchist Cookbook, why the Anarchist Cookbook was published. It's the most famous popular weapons manuals, ma uh, famous and popular ma weapons manuals around the world. Um, in fact, if you own it in the United Kingdom, you can be arrested and incarcerated under the Terrorism Act. Uh, so, if, if the police don't like you. Um, Anyway, the Anarchist Cookbook came out in 1971. Uh, so it was written by a young student, 19-year-old student named William Powell. He was going to Wyndham College and he was an English major. And he went to the library and he just compiled all the stuff from library books. Uh, and then he also um, <coughs> ordered st some stuff from Paladin Press and he compiled this into the Anarchist Cookbook. His publisher, Lyle Stewart, uh, was known for publishing these, these risky kinds of books. Uh, he, had, uh, he had been called before John McClellan on, on another issue because he had published pro-Cuba books. And so he, he already was familiar with McClellan and the investigative committee. Uh, so uh, he published the Anarchist Cookbook knowing full well that this was going to be 
uh, was going to tweak the government. And when, uh, when Powell and Stewart appeared in the launch of the Atticus Cookbook, they even had people setting off cherry bombs in the background, and, and it was, uh, they made quite a spectacle of the launch of the Atticus Cookbook. So I think few people know that this text, which is so well known, was not just an anomic bomb-making manual, it actually was a, a political expression about what was happening with the government's investigation of speech. In 1971, <coughs> the other weather underground uh, bombed the Capitol. Uh, they were pro protesting the U.S. invasion of Laos. Uh, there was a column by John Chamberlain that was in a lot of newspapers at the time that blamed the anarchist cookbook. They blamed the anarchist cookbook and said, look, this is, this is a, the anarchist cookbook is a representation of this anomic anarchist uh, activity in the culture. And he pointed to hundreds of technical books on explosives and bomb making that were, were available in the Library of Congress. And he said, does any senator know how many Xerox copies have gone, gone out of his own congressional library? So there's, uh, there's this concern about technical information, not only in the anarchist cookbook, but in the libraries themselves. And libraries become sites of, uh, that are fraught with anxiety about what, kind, what kinds of information are in them. So another wrinkle uh, having to do with the anarchist cookbook is if you look at the anarchist cookbook, it's written in short passages. Little recipes for things, little dark. Okay, well, when kids get the Commodore 64 in the 1980s, they're typing stuff into bulletin boards. We don't have a worldwide, worldwide web yet. They're typing stuff, and they're not very good typists, and they also want to get attention for their bulletin board, so what are they going to type? Let's type some stuff from the anarchist cookbook, because that'll get other kids to come over to our bulletin board and look at what we've got. So that's when pyrotechnic, uh, that is, bomb making and explosive information on the web, that's when this gets started. Uh, it's, it's really adolescents who are typing stuff from paladin manuals, from the anarchist cookbook, short chunks of text. Uh, that can, that's mostly what's on there now, on the internet. It's still the same stuff from the old paladin press manuals, from the anarchist cookbook, from the poor man, man's James Bond. Uh, they're also uh, typing lots of stuff about dirty tricks. Um, that's when this really starts to become a problem on the web. Um, this will eventually get the attention of the FBI, uh, who do an investigation of bomb making information on the internet. Uh, but what they find is this kind of stuff and uh, that, that people have typed. And it starts to circulate and it starts to get collated. And then there are um, groups of adolescents, mostly, who try to perfect it and they try to prove that they actually tried it, you know, that they took the risk, whether they did or not, who knew. But it becomes a thing to prove your authenticity. Oh yeah, you know, I went out a little black stuff. But if you go to YouTube now, there are actually lots of videos of, of kids blowing stuff up. So, <laughs> so they, they may very well have been. They're out in the suburbs, so there's lots of terrain for them to go out and experiment. Okay. So I'm gonna um, just race through now a few subsequent cases that I discuss in my book. So what happens now? Um, so in 1979, there's a prior restraint order against the progressive for publishing, uh, revealing article on the hydrogen bomb. Now, it's in no way a how-to set of instructions. It's not. It's, it's talking about the nuclear industrial complex. But the government, the, government, the DOE, describes it as a how-to. And the judge who allows the prior restraint describes it as a how-to. And so there's at first, a prior restraint putting a, put on a uh, progressive from publishing this article, but eventually they are allowed to publish it. The prior restraint is overturned. Um, but what's kind of interesting about this case as well is that nucle nuclear secrets at this time, just having a thought about a nuclear secret is, was considered classified at birth, it was called. Classified at birth. So you couldn't even talk about any kind of nuclear technology without getting permission from the government. It's considered classified. So this is a, a major case uh, against prior restraint, but also um, 
uh, kind of revealing uh, whether nuclear secrets should be made public. And the progressives' argument, and Howard Moreland, who wrote the art article, was arguing that yes, in order to make accurate dis dis decisions about nuclear bombs and nuclear technology, people need to know. They need to know about the nuclear industrial complex and how these, basically how these weapons are made across a number of processing plants. Okay, 1990, um, David Foreman, who was the founder of Earth First, which was a splinter environmental group. They were, they were angry at the mainstream environmentalists like the Sierra Club. Uh, was formed, Earth First was formed by some angry lobbyists, former lobbyists. And uh, Foreman wrote, wrote a book called Eco Defense, which describes how to tree spike and do other things in the what? national forest. Tree spike. Tree spikes. Yeah, that's like you drive a clay spike into a tree so they can't be locked. And you do that to a whole uh, to a number of trees so that the loggers can't come in. Mm -hmm. It's not just that they can't be logged. If a chainsaw hits those tree spikes, <laughs> then it, it, it's, it turns it into shrapnel, which can then kill the operator of the chainsaw. Okay, yes, well, um, I, 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 I must refute sure. that, though. <laughs> there was only one case of that happening, perhaps. Although it's a highly disputed case of whether that person in the mill was actually injured by that. The, the, there's a dispute over that, so, but it's just probably not too much of my, of my topic. But. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, it, Foreman um, was brought into court. Uh, he was accused of conspiracy with some other actually truly, truly violent folks who were, who were damaging tr uh, um, ski lifts and uh, nuclear and power lines and stuff like that. They never could actually implicate him in it, but just because he handed a copy of his book, Eco Defense, to one of those people, to one of those uh, more violent radicals, uh, he was considered to be part of the conspiracy. Um, and unfortunately, he plea bargained, so it never actually made it through a, a, a full court hearing. The publisher of Eco Defense, who I interviewed in Chico, California, um, was much more vocal about his right to publish Eco Defense and made a statement to the judge in the trial that it was, it was absolutely his right to publish Eco Defense. Okay, in 1996, at the trial of Timothy McVeigh, uh, homemade C4 by one of the Paladin writers, Ragnar Benson, was used against McVeigh, even though there never was any connection at all between this book and McVeigh's bond. Um, and the Turner Diaries, which is uh, it's a novel, actually, um, it, it describes blowing up a federal bill building. It was introduced to, there's some interesting things going on with creative works in the courts that have what's considered to be some kind of technical instruction. Edward Abbey's The Monkey Wrench Gang, if any of you are familiar with that, was also, has also been introduced uh, at court. Um, in 1997, Paladin Press was held liable for a hitman. This book uh, was written by a housewife in Florida. Um, it was originally written as a novel. And when she sent the novel to Paladin Press, uh, Paladin said, well, why don't you make this into a technical manual? And so you can see it's hitman, a technical manual for independent contractors that describes how to murder people, how to be a hitman. Now, some guy actually used it to murder three people. He bought this book and he murdered three people and they, uh, at the trial they went uh, point by point through the stuff that he used in it. Um, and Paladin was held liable for that book and they had to settle with the family of the murdered folks, people, the victims. Um, so we had that case. In 2000, uh, Tattered Cover, the Tattered Cover bookstore, uh, refused a search warrant for purchase records for the secrets of methamphetamine manufacture. was written by a chemist called Uncle Fester. And uh, he publishes separate, he's published like 12 editions of secrets of methamphetamine manufacture. And for him, it's a political act. He thinks that pharmaceutical companies have too much control over drugs. So he's got all these political statements at the beginning of this. Um, this book has been introduced in numerous trials against people who are accused of methamphetamine manufacture. Uh, the tattered cover refused the search warrant to produce their, bar, their, uh, their sales records for this book, um, and they won that case. 
Uh, after 911, things become quite different. Uh, before this time, there are some, they're quite robust defenses of this, of this kind of work, even though they're contentious. Um, but in 2002, uh, an anti-globalization activist, he was only 20 at the time, he was arrested for posting a link to the Reclaim Guide on his webpage. The Reclaim Guide was a uh, compendium of some kind of small weapons making, like uh, how to make a bomb using a tennis ball stuffed with match heads. Um, and he says that he didn't even write it, he just posted the link to it. Uh, but he was arrested, and once again there was a plea, plea bargain, and he served a year in prison for doing this. Now, uh, a computer science professor at Carnegie Mellon mirrored the site with the Reclaim Guide, and nobody ever went after him. That still exists. Okay, so, so once again, the target is that people who are considered to be enemies of the state. Um, Rod Coronado, who you may, some of you may know because he burned down the mink lab here, uh, uh, after he got out of prison, he started going around on the lecture circuit talking about his animal rights activism, including his violent activism. And in one of these talks, somebody asked him, it's not clear what she asked him. There was an FBI agent in the audience, of course, because they're following right there and out all around the place. Uh, but she may have asked him, how did you make your bomb used for, the, for some of these uh, arson, acts of arson? She may have said, how did you make the bomb? Or, how do you make a bomb? Now, this is kind of critical. Because the FBI interpreted it as, how do you make a bomb? Which means, it direct, means it's directly instructive. So they arrested him for that. And I'm going to tell you about the law that allows them to do this now in a second. In 2010, the Hutari, who you may have heard of, because they're in Michigan. Um, they're these kind of right-wing militia who, uh, they, were, they were hoping that a small, quite violent militia units all around the country would mm -hmm. rise up and overthrow the US government. Um, they were accused of seditious conspiracy, and a bunch of the texts that they had were collected against them, but they were also accused of teaching use of explosive materials and giving actual instruction. Uh, the FBI collected all kinds of text manuals from them that were allegedly used in this instruction. They were exonerated of seditious conspiracy, but at the same time, if you are suspected of being a jihadist, things go di very differently for you. The Hutari, they might let off, but they're not letting off anybody they think are jihadists. So in 2011, this guy, Emerson Bagley, was just kind of seemed like a sad sack. He was just living in his mother's basement. Really, it's kind of a stereotypical case. And he's online a lot. And he posted uh, this thing called the Explosives Course by the martyred shape professor on some kind of forum, uh, and he was convicted of doing that. So just the act of posting now a manual online, if prosecutors don't like you, you can uh, get convicted of that. And then in, in 2013, uh, Tarek Mahana uh, was just convicted for just translating an alleged Al-Qaeda Al document. This document is a kind of call to arms. It's not really instructional. Uh, but just because he translated it, he got eight years in prison. Uh, and uh, he had posted it on a Salafi jihadist forum. Now, there's no evidence that, um, that this, well, there was very, I should say there was very little evidence that this document, this call to arms, uh, that he had ever talked to Al-Qaeda or that he was doing it for Al-Qaeda. The prosecutors wanted to prove this. But right now, there are a number of um, sort of amateur investigators uh, who go around and collect all of this kind of information that they can, instructional or calls to arms, this kind of stuff. They, they maintain huge databases of it. And then they're called in by federal prosecutors to testify at these trials. And what they do is they just select from some of these documents that they think are the most frightening or contentious, and they use it to, to uh, connect the defendant to Al-Qaeda in a kind of loose way. But juries, if they hear Al-Qaeda, they make the connection, even though there's no direct connection. Okay, so, uh, so right now, um, if we look from the 19th century to now, there are two pieces of legislation that are making these recent cases possible uh, in actual 
prosecution for owning popular weapons manuals. Um, 842P makes it a crime to distri distribute information related to explosives, destructive devices, and weapons of mass destru destruction for use in a federal crime. Coronado was accused of this. Sherman Austin was accused of this. Uh, so it's, and it's used very loosely. And it's usually when federal prosecutors want to uh, go after an enemy of the state, then they, they, and now they can collect vast databases of stuff on people's computers and accuse them then under 842P. Now usually they use 842P if they can't actually prove a real conspiracy. So they still want to get the person, so they just use H42P. And then uh, providing material support to, to terrorists, that, uh, that means that the defendant actually has to be linked to an organization like Al-Qaeda. Uh, that's also being used now against, uh, against uh, various people like Tariq Mahana uh, to say that, well, he's, he's, he, was, he was in leech. He was in allegiance with Al-Qaeda, and therefore he can be charged under providing material support to terrorists. So I just want to leave um, a few questions that I was left with. I'm, that was a really quite a broad overview of my, of my book, which is <laughs> quite detailed. But here's some questions that, that arose for me. Are there, are there wrong hands? Are there wrong hands for unclassified technical information? Are there people that should have it and should produce it? Um, to what extent can one's reading, or even simple ownership of texts, like Science of Revolutionary Warfare, like the Anarchist Cookbook, to what extent can one's reading or even simple ownership of text reveal conspiratorial intent? <laughs> Should these be used in court to prove intent? Are these texts political and therefore protect, fully protected by the First Amendment? Or do they, do they fall into an exempt category uh, as purely technical and material support? How much power should the state have to regulate these texts and use them to gain convictions against those deep enemies of the state? And finally, what are the limits of tolerance? Thank you.